Today on Let the Bible Speak. It's one of the symptoms of a corrupt culture. We'll talk about the death of a vital virtue today on Let the Bible Speak. Greetings and welcome. I'm so glad you're here for our Bible study today, and I hope we can talk about some things that will make you stop and think and apply the Scriptures to your life. I want us to go to the book of Jeremiah today and read a passage of Scripture that could just as easily have been written in our own generation. Jeremiah was a preacher with a broken heart. It grieved him to see his people turn away from God and turn to sin, do idols. And God commissioned him to cry out against the wickedness of the nation and prophesy of their coming doom if they did not repent. There was plenty for Jeremiah to weep about, even before the destruction of the city and the coming captivity. God's people were in a sorry spiritual condition and should have been ashamed of what was happening, but they were not. And so in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 15, the prophet says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord." I wonder what Jeremiah would say if he were alive today. Our lesson today is titled, The Death of Shame, and I'll return with our study after a song from the congregation. Worship the Lord, He is worthy of praise. Sing to Him now a new song. Give to Him glory the rest of our days. Let Oxford American Dictionary defines shame as a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by the consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior. God designed our conscience to bother us when we do evil. If the conscience is performing as it should, we should feel ashamed when we sin. The Bible teaches that Adam and Eve lived in a state of innocence, and they had no reason to ever experience shame until the devil tempted Eve and the pair sinned. Suddenly they realized they were naked and they were shamed and the Bible says they hid themselves. They became aware of right and wrong, and ever since, mankind has had an intuitive sense of shame and guilt when we do something that violates God's moral standard. What happens, though, when the conscience is not working like it should? What happens when our values and our sense of right and wrong become perverted? Well, when that happens, we lose the ability to be ashamed. The sense of shame diminishes as our conscience becomes hardened. The Bible teaches that the ability to be embarrassed and made ashamed of wrong behavior is actually a virtue. But we're witnessing the death of shame in our modern culture. In fact, we're even seeing its demise among Christians. In Jeremiah's day, God's people were committing idolatry and immorality. Their hearts were turned from God to wickedness, and Jeremiah says they should have been ashamed of themselves, but instead they were not ashamed, and they had lost the ability to blush. 
I don't know of any ancient indictment that applies any more to our world today than that. We are witnessing the death of shame. You know, it appears there's hardly a sin that has not been brought out of the shadows and into plain view today. We now celebrate what a few generations ago we were embarrassed to even talk about, much less practice. Things that used to make people blush to see or even mention, we now think little or nothing of them. Jeremiah says, Were they ashamed when they committed abomination, which means something detestable? Nay, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. Now that's a stark contrast with Ezra who prayed about Israel's sin in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 6 and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to Thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. The sin of his day so distressed the heart of Ezra that he couldn't even look up to God. It made him blush to think about the evil the people had committed. The Apostle Paul even warned the church in Philippians 3 and verse 19 about those who had made themselves enemies of the cross of Christ, he says, whose glory is in their shame. In other words, they were proud of the things they were, that were shameful and that should have made them blush. Today's sin is not only overtly practiced, it is openly paraded and flaunted in the face of God. We're witnessing the death of shame. In the opinion of some, it is appropriate perhaps to shame those who don't share the same political views or those who don't embrace and celebrate the same things they do, but we're told that sin is not something to be ashamed about. In fact, if you paint sinful behavior as shameful behavior, then you are made out to be the wicked person. As the prophet Isaiah said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20. Losing the ability to blush is one of the symptoms of a rotting and a sin-hardened culture, an upside-down culture. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 5 says that the just Lord is in the midst thereof. He will not do iniquity. Every morning doth He bring His judgment to light. He faileth not. But the unjust knoweth no shame. Our world today knows very little shame, if any. What a seismic shift has occurred in how certain things are viewed in our society. My, how far we have fallen and how we perceive things today compared to how we viewed them just a few years ago. In fact, if the people of 50 and 100 years ago could come back from the grave, wouldn't they be shocked to see the world as it is today? I'm not talking about mere social changes or technological changes. I'm talking about moral changes, religious changes. You may say, but these things have always gone on. We've always had sin in the world. Oh yes, but at least as far as modern times are concerned, things are different today. Whereas sin once slunk in the shadows, today it is on full display, and we sin without any sense of shame. First of all, I would suggest we have witnessed the death of shame when it comes to immodest and indecent dress. It's appalling how people dress in public today. Our culture has been steadily lowering the standards of modesty until people now have no sense of embarrassment about see, being seen in public in revealing or tight and suggestive clothing. I perhaps, like you, shake my head at what I see people wearing in the department store or in restaurants or in the airport or just walking up and down the street. We become desensitized to it today. But again, what would people who lived just a generation or two ago say if they were to come back and see people in the public square today? I would suggest that we have reached a point today where there are no standards of modesty left no matter how little clothing a person is wearing. If so, what are those standards? Now the Bible teaches that people interested in pleasing God should have a sense of shame concerning how we dress. When Jesus rebuked the lukewarm and indifferent church in Laodicea in Revelation the third chapter beginning in the 17th verse, He said they were spiritually naked. He urged them to repent that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear." Now the Lord is talking about a spiritual state, but for the metaphor to have any meaning, there must be truth in the literal statement as well. In other words, we can conclude that God considers it a shameful thing for a person to appear naked before others. And this goes back to the beginning of time. It doesn't bother a baby to be unclothed because they're innocent. Impure thoughts don't enter their innocent minds. But when we mature, that changes. 
When Adam and Eve forfeited their state of innocence by sinning, the immediate result was that they realized they were naked and the Bible says they were ashamed of it. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7 tells us that they attempted to cover their nakedness by sewing fig leaves together and they hid themselves in the garden. And when God confronted them, their meager efforts to cover their nakedness were not enough. And God made them garments or tunics from the skins of animals to adequately cover them. Now again, here we have a spiritual application intended by the writer of Genesis, I'm well aware, but for the metaphor to have any meaning, the literal scenario and the literal statement must be true as well. People should be ashamed to parade themselves in front of others inadequately and indecently clothed. Now the tunics that God made in the garden covered much more than fig leaves did. Yet fig leaves cover about as much or leave about as much to the imagination as some of the apparel that we see in public today. Is there not a lack of shame when people wear clothes that barely cover their bodies? Shouldn't we be embarrassed and blush by the tight, revealing, and suggestive clothing that we see today? In fact, nearly everywhere you look. It's not reserved to the beach anymore. It's everywhere you look. Now, clothing styles and trends come and go, and different cultures have different expectations of dress. But God's standards do not change. And God's Word does set forth some principles that we need to apply regardless of what age or culture we live in. Remember this, friend. We don't apply the culture to God's Word. We apply God's Word to the culture. And we change to conform to God's standard. We don't lower God's standard to meet the world's. Now Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, "...in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or, go or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works." Now a woman's apparel should reflect shamefacedness, the apostle says, or the ability to blush. It should portray a right inward spirit, in other words. Everything about her apparel should portray what she is on the inside. And it should reflect godliness, he says. Well, that can't be said of much of the clothing we see today by a long shot. In the Old Testament, Moses reminded the people of a principle that goes back to the creation itself in Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, one that we should be aware of today as well. There Moses said, The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. In other words, men and women are to dress distinctive from each other. And because it comes from the women's section at Belk or Dillard's doesn't necessarily mean that it pertains unto a woman either. In today's dress, there is very little difference between what men and women wear, and we become used to that. But Moses said that such is an abomination to God. Now I believe that Moses is reminding them of an eternal principle. He's not merely codifying some ordinance under the Mosaic system. He is referring to something that goes back to creation. You know, there are other things in the Old Testament called abominations, which means something detestable, things that were to be considered abominations to the people. But notice that here he says it is an abomination to God. That's different from those things that are called abominable to the Israelites. This is something like the things mentioned in Proverbs 6, such as pride and shedding innocent blood, that is detestable to God. In other words, it's offensive to His person and His divine wisdom and His creative order. And that transcends any particular dispensation of time. God in His nature and in His overall purpose for mankind, He doesn't change. Today, though, the lines have been so blurred that it's hard to tell the difference between men and women. Now, our culture, I realize, makes fun of these ideas, and sadly, many professing Christians make fun and reject these ideas. But God is concerned about how we dress, and we need to have the ability to be embarrassed, and we should blush over the indecent and immodest dress that characterizes our society today. But we've seen the death of shame when it comes to indecent dress. You know, we've also witnessed the death of shame concerning sexual immorality. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. The Hebrew writer said in no uncertain terms in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4, Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. God will judge the sexually immoral, the Bible says. 
Now God sanctions the marriage of one man to one woman, Matthew chapter 19 verses 1 through, uh, verses 1 through 9. He sanctions the marriage of one man to one woman and, and, and the Hebrew writer says this is honorable and there is no sin involved in such a relationship. But listen now, anything outside of that arrangement is wrong and it's sinful in God's sight. But people today think nothing of living together outside of marriage or sleeping around or leaving their spouse for someone else. And that's not even mentioning many of the shocking situations and behavior that we hear about on the news and in the media on nearly a daily basis anymore. Now again, sin is not a new thing. I'm well aware that there has been sexual immorality in the world since nearly the beginning of time. And sexual sin is always wrong in God's sight regardless of the who, when, where, how, and why. Sin is sin. But I would suggest what is different today than from a few years ago is that immoral behavior used to belong in the shadows and it was scandalous to even talk about it. But today it's on our television set, it's in most movies that you watch, it's in most of the songs you hear, it's in our own families, our neighborhoods, and even our churches. Paul said it should not be named once among us who are saints. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 verses 11 and 12, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. What has happened to our ability to even be embarrassed by the immoral conduct of our world? When we can no longer be embarrassed by sin and ungodliness being paraded before us, it is a foreboding sign of how far a society has fallen into sin. And when nothing shocks us anymore, we are in a moral freefall, and there's no limit to how depraved and tolerant of sin we will become. And then what about the insobriety of our world today? Have we no shame about the drunkenness and the obsession with drugs and alcohol that characterizes our modern society? Again, what once was seen in bars and back alleys is now everywhere you turn. Our culture is nearly in a drunken stupor and drugs are not only being legalized, they're being promoted and they are being glorified and normalized. Alcohol and drugs, however, destroy minds, bodies, careers, families, and lives, and you have the history of the world to prove it. And yet more and more people are indulging in them. No longer do you have to find a liquor store in a seedy part of town. Alcohol is now promoted in every restaurant, even in fast food establishments, and nearly every venue you can imagine. We're obsessed with it. Today, everywhere you turn, you find all kinds of people, young, old, men and women, white collar, blue collar, all classes of people indulging in strong drink until our culture has become saturated with it and people are almost obsessed with it. The Word of God, on the other hand, depicts it as a destructive thing that destroys lives and souls. For example, the wise man said, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Intoxication is condemned by the Scriptures. And if you'll look into it, you'll find that according to the Scriptures, intoxication is not a state, it is a process that a Christian who is interested in godliness and holiness does not allow him or, himself, him or herself to begin. And the results of the drug and alcohol culture around us should cause every Christian to blush and to run away from it, not become a part of it. And finally, we can see the death of shame in the way we talk today in the impure and filthy speech that increasingly dominates our discourse. Again, I'm truly shocked, aren't you, by the vulgar, filthy, and irreverent language that we hear nearly everywhere we turn today. There are words that were shocking to most people just a few years ago. They were abrasive. They were coarse at the very least, if not outright ungodly and filthy to the minds of most people that are now spewed in almost every movie, even in news broadcasts. All that. Now they bleep it out, but you can hear enough and see their lips enough that they might as well go ahead and play it. I overhear people in the grocery store, in the restaurant, walking down the street who casually use such filthy and sometimes blasphemous language in even the most mundane of conversations. And it's not just men. It's men, it's women, it's children, it's elderly people. That was scandalous a generation ago to use words in the public square 
that now don't even faze most people to hear them. They're just like other words. Where are the mothers who used to threaten to wash their children's mouths out with soap? I'll tell you where many of them are. They're right there using the same language and the same filthy speech. And they ought to be ashamed. Listen again to Paul now in Ephesians chapter 5 beginning verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Colossians 3 and verse 8 says, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. It's nothing to most people today to utter the name of God in an oath or to blasphemously use the lovely name of Jesus as a byword or as a curse word. Movies, television shows, videos on social media, sometimes even statements from our politicians, the news, common everyday conversation. It's now laced with filth and vulgarity and innuendo and we think very little about it. We're getting used to it. We're getting used to the dark. We've been desensitized. Parents, I want to urge you to think about the language you're teaching your children to use. Think about the lack of shame that we're raising them to have. Because this is a sobering thought. If you think society is bad now, if you think we're in a moral free fall right now, when we can hardly blush at what we see right now, how we dress right now, how people are living right now, how people talk right now. Pray tell, where will we be 20 or 30 years from now? Young people, listen. Preserve the innocence of your little children as long as you can. Many of us need to open our eyes and see just how desensitized to sin and evil we've become. Teach your children to blush. Reclaim that virtue yourself. Many of us need to get back in the Word of God and reclaim that virtue of being able to be embarrassed. It is a virtue, and it means we have a conscience, and that conscience is operating like God intended for it to. It means that we're sensitive to that which is right and good and holy. Were they ashamed, though, when they committed abomination? Jeremiah asked him long ago. Nay, they were not ashamed. Neither could they blush.
Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts, plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. If you're finding it increasingly difficult to blush, that's a symptom that you're becoming desensitized by this world and by the sin and evil of our day. I think we all need to be reminded of the admonition of the Apostle Paul to the Romans in Romans chapter 12 when he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you'd like a copy of our lesson today, we'll be happy to send it to you. That free printed copy is available if you'll simply ask for the title, The Death of Shame. Get in touch with us and ask for it and we'll send it as quickly as we can. Remember, we're also online, ltbstv.org. You can find past sermons and studies there. And we're on social media, so be sure to like and follow the various platforms uh, and encourage your friends to do the same. Thank you for joining me today. I hope you'll make your plans to join me back here next time we gather for another Bible study. Until then, I hope you have a wonderful and a safe and healthy week. May God bless you as you search His Word and seek to do His will. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by The Church of Christ. For more information, including our past broadcast and sermon transcripts, visit ltbstv.org. Thanks for being with us today. Join us next time for Let the Bible Speak.